know that some of you wondered why today in our scriptural reading, instead of having an Old Testament and a New Testament reading, that both readings were from the New Testament. It is because in both of those passages we find our text today. I wanted you to hear it. As a matter of fact, I want you to hear it again, so I'm going to read both of them. Uh, thank you, Sister Roundtree and Sister Aker, for sharing those scriptures with those of us who are here today in worship. Matthew 26, verses 30 through 35. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Mm -hmm. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. <laughs> and after a while came out unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayed thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Amen. Amen. Last Sunday, I preached to you on the subject, Judas's betrayal of Jesus. Yeah. Today, I want to talk about <clears throat> Peter's denial of Jesus. Peter's denial. Of Jesus. Of all of the people that we read about in the Bible, Simon Peter is without question one of my favorites. I like reading about Peter because he is such a prime example of human frailty. He is so much like us. Mm -hmm. He is a good person, but he has his flaws. He's strong in some ways, but he's vulnerable in others. Yeah. 
He's brave at times, yet cowardly within hours. Peter vacillates from one character trait to another between his weaknesses and his strengths. He's good, but not saintly. He has a raw, unpolished demeanor. In some ways, he's crude. He will speak before thinking. And when you read about him, you'll see that he sometimes fails. Mm -hmm. Observing Peter and seeing his shortcomings gives people like me hope that maybe I too can be of some good use in God's kingdom work. Peter was, among other things, outspoken. He was bold and decisive. He didn't have to, you didn't, didn't have to wonder what opinion his was or, or where he stood on an issue. If he was in, he was all in. <laughs> Peter was the leader of the disciples. In four passages of scripture where the disciples are listed by name, in every case, the first name given is Peter. I should mention that Peter was not the name that he was given at birth. His parents named him Simon, but Jesus called him Peter. The name Peter means stone or rock. In John's Gospel, Simon was ironically not giving Jesus a new name, but he was, has identified him for who he really is. He calls Jesus the Christ, meaning the anointed one who is the Messiah. And for the first time in the scriptures, someone refers to Jesus as the Christ. Simon says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus, in turn, says to Simon, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you study the scriptures, you will notice that sometimes Jesus refers to him as Simon, and at other times, Peter, and still at other times, Simon Peter. Why, you ask? By nature, Simon was hot-tempered and undependable. While he was often the first in line, he was also sometimes the first to get out of line. He had a good heart, but, but there were times when he also had a bristle for a backbone. You just didn't know what to expect of him. Sometimes he behaved like Simon, and at other times, like Peter. John MacArthur shares in his book, Twelve Ordinary Men, that Tommy Lasorda, former manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, tells of a young, skinny pitcher who was new in the Dodgers minor league system. The youngster was somewhat timid, but had an extraordinarily powerful and accurate pitching arm. Lasorda was convinced that the young pitcher had the potential to be one of the greatest ever. But Lasorda says the young man needed to be more fierce and competitive. He needed to lose his timidity. So Lasorda gave him a nickname that was exactly the opposite of his personality. Bulldog. <laughs> Over the years, that is exactly what Oral Hershiser became. One of the most tenacious competitors who ever took the mound in the major leagues. The nickname became a constant reminder of what he ought to be 
And before long, it shaped his whole attitude. Such was the case with Simon. When Jesus named him Peter, he gave him the name of the person that he wanted Simon to become. A person who was a rock. A disciple who was steady. One who was sure. Who was unwavering in his dedication to the cause of Jesus Christ. Simon would be transformed into Peter, the rock. When we see Simon Peter through the Gospels and in the book of Acts, we see a man who is growing, who's evolving, who's developing into the rock. Sometimes we see more of his Simon side and at other times more mature Peter's side. He was becoming that man whom Jesus would depend on to be a critical proclaimer of the gospel, a groundbreaker for the Christian faith, and a foundation stone upon which the Christian church would be established. In our text, we see Peter with Jesus and the other disciples in the upper room, where they met to observe the Passover. And after eating the Passover meal, Jesus instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper. Yeah. They ate, they sung in him, and they went out into the Mount of Olives. There in the Mount of Olives, Jesus says this to his disciples, all of you shall be offended because of me tonight. And then he quotes Zechariah 13 and seven and says, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. Peter immediately responds to Jesus saying, Though all men shall be offended because of you, yet will I never be offended. Never. Peter declares emphatically to Jesus in front of the other disciples that he will never be offended because of Jesus. He was saying, no matter what happens, you can depend on me, Lord. Yeah. These other guys might run, but I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end. You can count on me. Yeah. Jesus said to Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. Peter said, I might die with you, but I promise you, I will never deny you. And the other disciples said, the same goes for us. Not long after that, there on the Mount of Olives, Judas and a large number of men with swords and knives come to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls out his sword to defend Jesus he cuts off the soldier's ear. I imagine that Peter said to Jesus, See, I told you I'd stick with you. Yeah. I told you I had your back. Yeah. Jesus tells Peter to put away his sword. Yeah. By the end of the ordeal, Jesus is arrested. And we read the sobering words of Matthew 26 and 56. Then all the disciples forsook him and ran away. All of Jesus' disciples, including Peter, deserted Jesus and ran away. The disciples abandoned Jesus. They were afraid, they were scared for their lives, and they ran away and left Jesus all alone. Now in Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75, Jesus is in the palace where he is being questioned, where he is being interrogated. And Peter is hanging around the outside, trying to see and hear what's happening to Jesus. And while Jesus is on trial on the inside, Peter is put on the spot 
on the outside. First, a young lady recognizes Peter and says to him, you were with Jesus. Peter told her in so many words, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and you don't know what you're talking about. Peter denies knowing Jesus. Peter then moves away from her and goes on the porch of the palace. Another young lady saw Peter and, and she says to the others around that Peter was with Jesus. And Peter hearing her said, look, I don't know him. The scripture says this time he denied with an oath. An oath was a solemn promise as if to say, I promise you I don't know him. After a while, Someone else standing near Peter said, yes, you're one of his followers. Your speech gives you away. You talk like a Galilean. <laughs> this time, the third time, Peter had a relapse. <laughs> he reverted to his ways before he met Jesus. The scripture says he cursed and swore. He used profanity. He said some four-letter words. The fisherman in him came out. He put up a good piece of cursing. Yeah. I think Peter must have thought, I bet they believe me now. Because Jesus' disciples don't talk like that. And immediately, the rooster crowed. When the rooster crowed, a heavy, piercing weight of guilt Jesus. overcame Peter. Jesus. He remembered the words of Jesus. You will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Yeah. Peter had failed on that bold promise that he made to Jesus. I will die with you, but I will never deny you. He had every reason to believe that Peter truly meant what he said. He had the best of intentions, but when he was tested, Peter was so afraid for his life that he denied knowing Jesus. One of the gospel writers said, when the rooster crowed, Jesus and Peter looked at each other. And Peter was so ashamed of himself, of his denial of Jesus, that he wept bitterly. I know what you're asking. How could Peter deny Jesus? With all that they've been through together, as close as the two of them were, how, how, Peter, of all people, the leader of the disciples, the spokesman for the group, Peter had heard Jesus teach. He'd seen Jesus do miracles. Yeah. Peter had served others in ministry with Jesus. He'd literally been in a storm on the sea and Jesus saved him and the other disciples. He was with Jesus when most of the disciples were not. He was one of only a few who was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and was privileged to see Jesus conversing with Moses and Elijah. He had even done something that no one else in the world had ever done except Jesus. He walked on water. Oh, because of Jesus. How could Peter deny Jesus? Before you back out, Peter, before you put him on trial, before you send him to prison, ask yourself the question, would I ever deny Christ? Mm -hmm. If you were in Peter's shoes, 
What would you have done? Fortunately, Peter's story does not end with his denial of Jesus. When we study his life and ministry, we must include the portion of his biography that's found in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, Peter's preaching about Jesus and, and, and Pentecost. He preaches that the Jews falsely accused and crucified Jesus. Yeah. Peter preaches that Jesus arose from the dead. Yeah. Peter tells them that they need to repent of their sins. Right. He tells them that it, they should become disciples of Jesus like him. He gave the call to discipleship after that sermon and 3,000 People gave their lives to Jesus and were saved. Yeah. Yeah. 3,000. Yeah. In Acts chapter 3, Peter preached again. In Acts chapter 4, he and John were arrested for preaching. And they were commanded not to preach anymore. When they were released from jail, the first thing they did was went to church and had a prayer meeting. They asked God for boldness, and he granted them, and they kept on preaching. Peter had earlier promised Jesus that he would not deny him, and, fa and he failed. But thanks be to God, when we read in Acts, Peter has recovered from his downfall and is totally dedicated at all costs to the cause of Jesus Christ. Yeah. God wants you to know today that even when you fall, even when you fail, he will forgive you. And he will use you as long as you dedicate yourself to him. Donnie McClifton used to sing a song that said, we fall down, but we get up again. That's what Peter did. He fell down, but he got back up again. When Peter got up, he was more dedicated to Christ than he was before. When he got up, he had more courage than he had when he fell. He fell down lying and cursing. He got up singing hymns and preaching the gospel. Peter fell down scared of men. He got up challenging men to examine their lives and confess their sins. He fell down trying to save his life. He got up knowing that only Jesus could save him. When Peter got up, God used him to preach the gospel. When he got up, he was more determined than ever before to preach the good news. Nothing could stop Peter now. Threats on his life didn't stop him. Put him in jail didn't stop him. He kept on preaching. That's what God is looking for in us. People who will keep on keeping on. People who are committed. People who are dedicated. People with determination. God wants servants with drive and perseverance with staying power. In Acts 5 and 29, Peter and others were in prison for preaching about Jesus. They were brought out of prison, out of their cells, and asked, didn't we clearly command you not to preach in Jesus' name? And this same Peter, who had denied Christ earlier, now says, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's what I say to you today, whatever your situation, whatever your predicament, whatever your dilemma, whatever your challenge, obey God rather than man. Yeah. Obedience is better than sacrifice. As I close, I must tell you about somebody who will never deny you. Unless you deny him. That's what the scripture says. 
But as long as you are not ashamed of him, he'll go with you until the end. His name is Jesus. He is the Son of God. One Sunday now called Palm Sunday. Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a victor before the fight. Yeah. Uh, they had a parade for him before he won the battle. Yeah. They cheered his name. Yeah. They laid out the so-called royal carpet with their clothes and branches of palms. Yeah. They waved palm branches in the air for him. They called him Hosanna. Uh -huh. He rode on a donkey. Yeah. Like a king riding a beautiful horse. Yeah. He was celebrating on Sunday. Yeah. But on Thursday, he was arrested. Yeah. And on Friday, he was crucified. Yeah. They executed an innocent man. Uh -huh. There is something strange about what happened. Yeah. It is that Jesus could have prevented it, but he didn't. Yeah. He could have called legions of angels to take him away from Calvary, right. but he didn't. Right. Yeah. He stayed there and allowed his enemies to nail him to the cross. Yeah. It was a sad, horrific, and confusing time. Yeah. He was betrayed by one of his own disciples, Judas. Yeah. He was deserted by the remaining 11 disciples, yeah. and one of them, Peter, denied knowing Jesus. But Jesus went to the cross, and he died for them, and he died for you. That's why right, Jesus died for you. The scripture says, when you were yet in sin, he died for you. When you were on your way to hell, Jesus died for you. When you didn't deserve being saved, he died for you. He hung on that cross that Friday and died. Jesus suffered and bled and died. He gave his life and died. He shed his precious blood and died. He bled that innocent blood and died at Calvary to pay for our sins. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it reaches from the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley. That blood that gives me strength, it will never, never lose its power. He died on Friday, yeah. but early, yes. very early, yes. early before the rooster crowed on Sunday, yes. Jesus got up, yes. got up to a brand new day. Yes. He got up and night went away. Yes. He got up and made Sunday the new Sabbath. Yes. He got up and made heaven our new home. Yes. Jesus got up and left the grave empty. He got up and gave us peace with God. He got up and saved us from our sins and gave us victory. Jesus got up. And if nothing else, he made me happy. He got up and that's why we rejoice today. He got up and changed our lives for eternity. Thanks be, to God. Thanks be to God. Jesus did not deny us. But he died. he died. And he got up from the grave. And provided us. You. Me. With eternal life. With God. Throughout eternity. We should be as those people who were there when Jesus rode into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday. Yeah. We should be praising God. Hosanna! 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 Yes, 
for saving us, yes. for giving us the victory. Yes. It's a good feeling yes. to have the victory, yes. especially when you didn't fight. <laughs> it's a good thing to know you're the victor, yes. especially when you didn't suffer, when you didn't die, when you weren't nailed to the cross, when you didn't have to pay for your own sins. Oh, it's a good feeling this morning when I got that joy that not me but Jesus went to the cross. Not me but my Savior died. And it's a better feeling to know that blood will never lose. It's power. Next time something doesn't go your way, just remind yourself. His blood will never lose its power. When you get ready to drop your head, pick it up. His blood will never lose its power. When you feel hurt, don't worry about it. His blood will never, ever lose its power. You don't have anything to worry about when you're covered by his blood. When you're washed in his blood, everything is all right. Stop telling yourself everything's going to be all right. Everything's already all right. Because you're covered in his blood. Deacons, will you come? Choir's getting ready to sing.